Welcome to a new Exodus study. This is number 24, and we plan on going all the way through the chapter, 36 verses. After we give a hillbilly holler out to Denisa Gabriella, I believe is how I pronounce her name, and we'll just say she's in Eastern Europe and leave it at that. Here's your hillbilly holler all the way out there in Europe. She's a wonderful sister uh, in Christ, and we just thank you for... Uh, your prayers and uh, faithfulness as a friend of this ministry. So we get right into our study. It's going to be, i got to move a little bit to get through all of this, uh, but we want to do it, so let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this uh, opportunity to teach your word. I've, I learn, and then I just want to help others learn. All by the help of your Holy Spirit, guide us, help us to avoid error, Help us to understand, help us to apply it to our lives, help us to teach others, help us to glorify you in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. So we uh, take off now into the wilderness journey, beginning in verse 1. Uh, at this point, uh, there is hope for everybody involved entering the promised land. Uh, for Moses and Aaron and Caleb and all the rest of the Hebrew family. Um, but we're going to see uh, Joshua and Caleb as, uh, and only those under a certain age will actually get into the promised land. But we'll come to that as we begin, begin in verse 1. It says, And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of sin, and uh, that's a kind of an ironic name for this wilderness they're heading into, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. So it's uh, been about a 45 days um, journey that they've been traveling. And it says in verse 2, that's all the time it took for this to happen. <laughs> verse 2 and the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Mer Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Uh, so 45 days. And folks, it doesn't take people long to turn on you. And I mean turn on you for things that you have no control over. Things that don't really have anything to do with you. As a pastor, I've been there. I've seen it. I have people, uh, even not local BBF, but this happens locally and on the internet. People email me or call me or write me and say, oh, you're the best thing since uh, soft butter, you know, oh, I love you. And within two weeks, <laughs> sometimes they'll hear something that I'm teaching or, uh, or they'll just disappear without explanation. Uh, that's the way people are. And if you ever go into ministry, you better be prepared for that. Even before you start out in the ministry, get used to it. So, um, now, I have to tell you that the first time I read this, <laughs> I was thinking, you know, already, right in here, right now, all the people murmuring, if God just kill them all, he, he'd been justified. And, you know, the more I deal with people, uh, the more I'm amazed at the long-suffering of God course I look at my own life and I'm amazed that he let me live long enough to even be saved and then since being saved I've messed up and I've been having you know had the wrong attitude and everything um, his long suffering his mercy is just amazing and this is just I mean you could some people pick on God and they'll say well you know the fact he didn't let him go into the promised land didn't let Moses go into the promised land like, man, you know, you just aren't reading the whole thing. Not with both eyes open. <laughs> um, God puts up with so much. Now listen to the rest of this. This is just outrageous nonsense that they, they, they utter in their murmuring. Verse 3, And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now that's just a load of lies. 
I mean, obviously, God didn't bring him out there to kill him, and he wasn't going to kill him. But they're pleading for God to save them from bondage when he comes and takes them out of Egypt to begin with. And you'd think, if they're going to complain about anything, that it took 40 years. But you go back to Exodus 3, 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. That doesn't sound like happy time to me. Doesn't sound like all the Hebrews are just partying and sitting around, as they say, by the flesh pots and being full of bread. They're full of something, but it's not bread. It's just a big, huge lie. They weren't sitting by the flesh pots and eating to the full. And that's why God promised them, in uh, going back to Exodus 3, in, result, in, in response to their cry, in verse 7, we read verse 8, And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land, and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Why? Because they were hungry. And to, for them to pretend they weren't is a lie. And this accusation is just a total lie. So verse 4, Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. Now look at that. Instead of killing them all, he says, you know, we'll just rain bread from heaven. Because <laughs> their, their murmuring is blasphemous. When you falsely accuse God of lying, it's blasphemy. And they did, it was more than one lie mixed up in that blasphemy. But he's going to rain bread from heaven. The verse continues, And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. All he's requiring of them is to go out and, and get the bread from heaven that he's going to rain down. But it, there is a test involved. Um, verse 5 uh, describes this. It says, And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Um, so the test is, will they trust God and obey Him when it comes to the rules about this bread from he heaven that He's going to rain down? And we don't want to cover that. Let's wait a couple verses. We'll jump back into this. Verse 6 continues, And Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel, At even... Then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt. And in the morning, then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that you murmur against us? So, we're going to see a couple of miracles. We're going to see a, a miracle at evening, and then we're going to see a huge miracle that will really be an ongoing miracle for 40 years, but the first uh, sight of that miracle will be in the morning. Now, they're murmuring against God. Verse 8, And Moses said, uh, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against Him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. So, when they murmured, you know, they uh, it says that they murmured against Moses and Aaron, but they're really murmuring against the Lord. And, uh, you know, Moses and Aaron just doing what they're told. So, if they're going to accuse Moses and Aaron of bringing them out there to kill them. They're accusing the Lord. You know, it's um, something that we have to watch for. We better be careful about. And I believe America is right here. Thankless and ungrateful for what God's done for us. Um, people blame God for their own unhappiness, most of which they've brought on themselves most of the time. But even when they haven't brought, let's say someone's abused or something, um, they still don't turn to God and let Him fix it. They don't turn to Him for salvation, and sometimes they do, but then they don't walk in the Word, they don't live by the Word, they don't pray without ceasing, they don't preach the Gospel, they don't live lives that will please the Lord. 
And a lot of times it's the bitterness of that person that is the problem, not God. It's their own bitterness. And then, of course, they result to uh, a resort to uh, false accusations and unreasonable complaints uh, against the Lord. And I've talked to people and tried to reason with them. Just like these people, they become so unreasonable that God has to basically smack them. So, verse 9 continues, And Moses spake unto Aaron, Say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. Verse 10, And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud, or in the cloud. So, uh, this isn't really something to be happy about at this point. If I'm one of these Hebrews and I've got any brains at all, God shows up uh, in His glory in a cloud, I'm, I'm expecting to be killed. <laughs> but, God is gracious, and before the manna, the bread from heaven, God had a surprise uh, for the Hebrews. Verse 11 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Verse 12, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it sounds like a good time. A huge feast. And verse 13 uh, says, And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. So the evening they have the quail, and in the morning they have the dew lay around about the host. And what is that? Well, um, verse 14, And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoar frost on the ground. So this is something new. This is something they haven't seen before. Verse 15, And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given them to eat. Now, that word manna is in Hebrew translated, uh, transliterated into English as just manna, manna. And that means, what is it? And so that's the, the name for it that stuck. Now, uh, it's similar to uh, some things you'll find in our own language. Now, one story that may or may not be true, but it, it'd be, it, it's interesting, and I haven't really found that it's been proven not to be true, but there's some question about it, is the name of the kangaroo. Some of you may have heard this, but um, we're told by a lot of people that it's a legend. But the story goes that Captain James Cook uh, saw a, this strange creature with a pouch, and he looked at one of the aboriginal uh, people there, and he asked, uh, what do you call that? And um, they responded, um, kangaroo, which is supposed to have meant, what did you say? <laughs> but his recorder with him, a guy named Joseph Banks, he uh, wrote down a description of the animal and called it a kangaroo. And so from that point on, the animal was known as a kangaroo. Now, you know, like I said, we're not sure if the story is true, but that stuff happens. Uh, our English language is just one example. In all languages, there you'll hear uh, examples like that. Here in Ohio, um, you know, we, got, we named the state after the river that basically is the southern border. Um, runs all the way up, uh, you know, from Cincinnati up to uh, Wheeling, West Virginia, and uh, where West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Ohio meet. And uh, the river was uh, named, called Ohio by the Iroquois, and it simply meant good river. So you can kind of picture, you know, the Iroquois standing there, and someone says, whoa, what's this? I don't know, but it's a good river. Uh, what are we going to call it? Well, we'll call it good river. <laughs> But in their language, it was Ohio. So uh, this, I, I point that out because there's so much reality in the Bible that um, sometimes we just miss. 
Uh, what makes the Bible an amazing book is it's so real. It's so, so much like what we experience in, in our everyday lives or in our own world, our own time. So, uh, verse 16 continues, uh, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, an omer for every man. And if you were a Hebrew back in this day, you'd know what an omer was. Uh, according to the number of your persons, take ye every man for them which are in his tents. And so we're kind of guessing it's probably like a court, you know, have a court picture for each man. Verse 17 continues, and the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. Why? Well, some are bigger than others. Some have different metabolism. Uh, verse 18, and when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. And so they basically used this like we do corn um, or wheat, and they'd make uh, bread out of it. And so, uh, verse 19, And Moses said, Let no man leave of it till the morning. So a man would collect the amount he needed for his family, and everybody had plenty. And it was just this one little rule, verse 19, that there weren't supposed to be any leftovers. Um, it was sort of like going to an all-you-like-to-eat buffet. They've changed that. A lot of you say all-you-can-eat. Now they say all-you-like-to-eat uh, or something like that. Uh, but they don't let you take doggy bags from an all-you-can-eat or all-you-like-to-eat buffet. Um, but, uh, you know, God says he's going to provide every day. You don't have to worry about it, but, you know, humans are humans. You always have somebody stealing food from the all-you-can-eat buffet. And that's what happened here. So verse 20 says, Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left of it until the morning, keeping some leftovers. And it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. Uh, I can just imagine this was some stench. Uh, it was like a dead body. And if you never stumbled upon a dead animal that was a day or two old in the summer heat, then you probably haven't smelled anything this bad. <laughs> there are other things that can make really bad smells, but you get the idea. Uh, I remember one time, first time that ever happened to me, I was a teenager, I was walking along the road and there was dead, you know, roadkill. And we were just going to walk right past it. And man, we got within 10 feet of that thing and oh, we was holding our breath and running to get past it. And then we ran a little bit and spent, oh, kept running. Whew, bad stuff. And uh, I can imagine the Lord made it stink real good. Teach him some, a little bit of a lesson. And so verse 21 says, And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating, and when the sun waxed hot, it melted. And I, it's funny they use the word wax, because I've heard some people say this was like snow, but I think it was more like wax. I think it probably was very much like uh, leaving uh, wax out. You know, you have candies and things sometimes have a little wax on them. If you put it out in the sun, it'll melt. So every day, except the Sabbath day, it would just melt like wax. But on that Sabbath, when a miraculous event took place every week until after the death of Moses and Joshua was leading the Hebrews into the Promised Land. Uh, verse 22, And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Verse 23, And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and seed that ye will seed, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. So for six days you're not to have any leftovers, or you're going to wake up and have the smell of death, the stench. But... The day before the Sabbath, you were to collect and have leftovers. And then miraculously, not only would there not be a stench, um, but it would probably taste better <laughs> than the fresh. You know, uh, spaghetti and crab salad and chili and things like that's better the day after. Uh, you leave it in the refrigerator, pull it out and warm it up. So uh, verse 24 says, And they laid it up till the morning, as Moses bade, and it did not stink. Neither was there any worm therein. So that's a miracle. 
And in verse 25, And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. So that's the other thing. Is, you know, you're, you're seeing this every day except for Saturday or Sabbath. And then and you keep leftovers any other day, it turns to a stench. But on Saturday, it, it's fresh and tastes fine. That's miraculous. There's no natural explanation for why it would do that. And so uh, verse 24 says, And they laid it up to the morning as Moses bade, and it did not stink. Neither was there any worm therein. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today you shall not find it in the field. And verse 26, Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. So it's an amazing mir miracle. And most everybody uh, went along with this. They sat back and enjoyed the miracle and ate their leftovers on Sabbath and rested. But there's always a few idiots. And on this first occasion of Sabbath manna, we see the new Bible version crowd whose translation of the words of Moses were lacking. And so they were in error. And that's, that's I'm, not, I'm only halfway joking there. I mean, that's what causes a lot of error. Uh, people don't have the real book and they don't get the real truth. It's watered down or mushed up or what have you. And uh, so what happens? Well, verse 27, as I said, uh, some of the po folks uh, just didn't get the message. And so verse 27 says, And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? Now, listen, God could have just killed them. They're breaking the Sabbath. At least by intent, they went out to work. You know, picking up this manna was an act of labor, work. Um, but instead, he just, uh, the Lord, even the, he rebukes the people through Moses and Aaron here, but he's, he could have killed them. And he'd been justified, legally. Uh, Verse 29 says, See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place, let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So he repeats it. Instead of killing them, he repeats it. Um, and after this time, it seems that they got it. Verse 30 says, And so the people rested on the seventh day. Now, it might seem like the Lord's kind of chewing Moses out here. You have to remember that Moses is the mediator. Now, today we have one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And when Jesus was on the cross, God poured out his wrath on the sin of us on Jesus, the mediator. So Moses is a type of Christ and stands as the mediator between God and Israel. And he gets that short end of the stick. He gets the brunt of God's rebuke a number of times because of it. And I think there'll be some spats between them that are really humorous uh, later on. Um, I mean, they're serious, but they're humorous at the same time. So uh, he'll be, uh, you know, upbraiding the Hebrews, but he'll deliver it through the mediator, Moses, and Moses and Aaron, kind of a tag team mediation uh, there And verse 31 says, And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. So go eat some honey wafers, and you have an idea what manna tastes like. I've heard people over the years say, I wonder what it tastes like. Well, it tells you right there, you know. Um, I'm sure the texture was probably a little different, and it, you know, I'm sure it tasted better than any vanilla or honey wafer you'll eat. Um... But it gives you an idea. Now, by the way, the scholars have tried to come up with some natural explanation for this stuff. And it's just too stupid for words and not worth the time to waste on it. And they, some plant that they claim uh, dropped its flowers or something. And, you know, it's just, it makes no sense. Um, what would explain the fact that it only started after the children of Israel were going into the wilderness? They didn't find it the day before, the day before that, or the day before that, but suddenly, they, and it travels with them as they go for 40 years through the wilderness. I mean, it, and then why would a plant drop these things five days, uh, six days a week, and then one day out of the week, nothing? And why would the stuff it dropped rot 
those six days of the week if you left it overnight, but then this other night it doesn't. There's no natural explanation. That's where the scholars always get themselves in trouble, and you'll get in trouble if you follow the scholars, because they, they reject, they're practical atheists. They reject God, and they reject the supernatural. And so just ignore them. Verse 32, And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commandeth, fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. Uh, so we're going to close chapter 16 now with Moses gathering some of this manna. What is it? <laughs> and putting it in a pot and putting it into the ark. And you can remember the three things that were in the ark were the manna that we're seeing here, Aaron's budded rod and the stone tablets, the second uh, edition, uh, like your revised, they, they claim their King James Version was revised. <laughs> um, it, it's still the same, you know, word, the word of God, uh, with some uh, corrections to some typos and things like that. Well, Moses busts the first copy, and so God makes a second copy. And those are the three things in the ark now, the, the tablets, Aaron's rod, and manna. And uh, that's just good information. You might win a Bible trivia game by knowing that uh, the answer to that question. And so another miracle would be the fact that this pot of manna is going to last for uh, I don't know how many years off the top of my head. But uh, at some point, something happens. Um, it might have been the Philistines when they got into the ark. Uh, I'll have to look into that a little more and refresh my memory. I know I've looked into that before, but at some point the man is gone. But for years and years and years, hundreds of years, uh, there'd be a pot of manna in there. So we close, as I said, beginning verse 33. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein, and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. Verse 34, as the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. Verse 35 then, and the children of Israel did eat manna 40 years until they came to a land inhabited. They did eat manna until they came under the borders of the land of Canaan. It'll be quite a while before we get there, but in Joshua, if you're reading through your Bible, watch for that. There's, there's a point in time where the manna stops. And... Uh, so this is a daily miracle with an additionally amazing miracle every week on the Sabbath for 40 years. And yet these people will still rebel against the one doing the miracles. It's amazing. Verse uh, 36 closes the chapter. Now an omer is the tenth part of an even. What does that mean? I really don't know. I just know that that's true. And that's where we'll close chapter 16. We'll pick up chapter 17 next time. For solid King James Bible preaching and teaching, along with the encouragement of the Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, Tune in to our internet radio station available every day, 24 hours a day, at bbfohioradio.com. Join listeners from over 150 nations, all 50 U.S. states, and other U.S. territories who are tuning in and receiving free Bible teaching at bbfohioradio.com. This world is not my home.